Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Complete Sports Media's podcast. I'm your host, Darren Campbell, coming to you on a Monday here uh, after a busy weekend of sports. Uh, lots of uh, crazy basketball action. We've got some UFC to talk about. We've got some boxing to cover. Uh, there was five game sevens in the NHL. We're not going to get into that much tonight, but so many crazy, crazy, crazy events uh, over the weekend. And uh, we've got our two conference finals uh, set up now. Uh, the both East and the West have been set. And uh, shocking, definitely not that shocking in the East because it is number one against number two. Uh, when you look at it, you know, the regular season standings really – bared out but uh in the west it's number three against number four so that uh will involve a lot of talk about uh, all the craziness that's happened there but uh anyway let's uh bring in our great friend uh analyst that we uh usually bring in on a monday uh jason cameron's joining us uh hey buddy how was your weekend behind us uh Weekend was good. Great weekend of sports. Unfortunately, physically for me, my body wasn't doing so, so hot. Mm. That's okay. We, we continue. We move forward. So, um, but uh, surprising to me on how it all ended in the game sevens. Yeah. Surprising to me. Because. Yeah, me too. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, the game sevens were crazy and uh, they were both blowouts. Uh, absolutely not competitive games at all. Uh, to see the two teams that made the final last year, both go out in such dramatic blowouts. Uh, I think, I don't think anybody was was suspecting that Uh, really two hard fought series. And to see both these teams that a lot of people thought were going to be in the final game this year, uh, they really flamed out in in dramatic fashion. Yeah, they they sure did. Uh, Less the Bucks, definitely more the Suns. Because the Suns game, let's be honest, was over by halftime. Yeah. That game was completely over and done with by halftime. And at least with the Bucs Celtics, the Bucs still had a chance in the fourth until the Celtics just said, it's a rain of threes, a barrage of threes. Yeah. Three, 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 three. And then that's how they pulled away. Yeah. Yeah, there was definitely, that was the biggest tale. I think the Bucs were like four for 30 something uh, from three and, and the Boston hit 22 threes. That was a franchise record for them. So um, that was a difference, but, but one Oh nine 81, like I don't think anybody would have thought that that would have been that type of a score. Cause it was a, a super, super competitive seven game series. And, and Giannis is playing out of his head, just had an absolutely monster series. Uh, first guy to ever get 200 points, 100 rebounds, and 50 assists. Uh, First guy uh, since, like, back in Wilt Chamberlain days uh, to have two 2020 games back-to-back and lose both those games. Uh, So he tried his best, but uh, I think the biggest difference was missing Middleton. Uh, Middleton was just such a key loss for them. He didn't have that second go-to guy that could step up and be consistent and help him push him, push him forward into the next round. Yeah, exactly. Like, like if they had Middleton, that would have offset some of the scoring punch that the the Celtics had. Right. And like you said, Giannis with 25 points and 20 rebounds and and nine assists, he almost had a triple double. There is not actually not much more that you can expect him to do. Right. So for him being an MVP candidate, he did his job. He really yeah. did. He did his job. But if then if you look at the Celtics and their and their scoring with Williams stepping up and hitting seven threes. Yeah. Tatum with 23 points, Williams with 27 points, Brown with 19 points. And then that was the difference right there. Because Giannis had 25 points and Holiday with 21 points to help him out. But where was your third score? That's what they were missing. Yeah. Well, Grant Williams, that was his career high. Uh, the most most points he's ever had in a game in his life. And as well as, uh, you know, just hitting from downtown. They seem to uh, think that they could leave him open and try to, you know, guard the other guys. And uh, he made them pay with, I think, seven three-pointers in the game. Yeah, yeah, he made them pay big time. And also, too, I want to say, 
big shout out to Mr. Pritchard, who I, I love that guy. He's just like a little like Boston uh, Celtics, like spark plug. Came off the bench, hit three big threes in the fourth quarter. And that's really what's got him going in the fourth. Yeah. Yeah. He actually made me money. Uh, I had him in my captain spot in my draft <laughs> Kings. And uh, I was a little leery at first because he didn't play uh, until well into the game, but in his 17 minutes to get 14 points, five rebounds and three assists, like uh, that, that really put me over the top. I had Giannis, I had Tatum, I had, you know, the guys that were going to uh, produce, but uh, for me to put uh, Pritchard in there, I was really, really hoping that he would come in and he made and make a difference. And he sure did. He was, uh, that was one of the best games I've seen him play. Yeah, yeah, he, he played incredibly well. The team played incredibly well. And just un it's unfortunate for the Bucs that they they just did not have the scoring punch to keep up with them going down the stretch of that game. Yeah. Uh, Marcus Smart got hurt, uh, has, has a sprained foot, and uh, is questionable for game one of this upcoming series against the Heat. Uh, he was defensive player of the year this year. And he's such a huge catalyst for this team. He does everything on the floor and, and he doesn't take a lot of glory, but uh, this is quite a big loss for Boston going into the series against Miami. Yeah, it's a huge loss, man, because like that, not only is like he, their, their defensive quarterback and uh, the stalwart that they depend upon on the defensive end of the court, but also too, He's the guy that's facilitating the offense, and he's been a lot better at that throughout the course of this year, which has basically necessitated the change in the Celtics from where they were at the beginning of the year to the second half of the year, where they one of the best teams in the NBA. So his loss is going to be very notable uh, going forward into the next series. Yeah. Uh, it, it might be offset a little bit because Kyle Lowry is still dealing with his hamstring injury. And, uh, probably or, or they said he is out for sure 100 he will not play that first game uh he was injured back in the atlanta series in game three i believe it was missed the last <laughs> couple of games there came in a, a couple of times in that second round series against philly but um have not having lowry that's a, a big loss for miami yeah yeah that's that's a big loss for miami and also too that might even the playing field for both teams since they're both missing their their their, their top starting their starting point guards, yeah. so it's uh, it, it, but hey, I'm still very excited about this upcoming series between the Heat and the Celtics, the best two teams in the East, because mm -hmm. uh, they both had to fight to get to the position that they are now, and I I'm looking forward to seeing what happens next. Yeah, uh, Marcus <laughs> Smart uh, to me is is a big loss because I saw him covering Jimmy Butler. And being that guy that was going to be the defensive presence for them on him, uh, who do you see in his absence stepping up and and trying to cover Butler? Well, honestly, I, I think it might be done by committee. I think I think you're looking at like Grant Williams might switch off onto him. I think you're looking at like uh, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. I think for those two guys to be their top players on that team, I think uh, both of them will have to step up to accept the challenge of guarding Jim Butler and guys of that ilk, because, Hey, if you can do it on the offensive end, that's, that's fantastic. But for the defensive end, you just need will effort. And they, they have to exercise that if they want to win this series. So, yeah. Uh, home ice, uh, I mean, <laughs> home court advantage. Uh, how big is it for Miami in this series? Will that, do you think tip the scales in their favor? Yes. I, hey, home court advantage is something that you always play for in the playoffs. And, and their home court is uh, quite uh, effective. Their fans are ravenous. They're crazy up there in Miami. And I, and I think they're, they're going to be a lot more comfortable, obviously, in the confines of their, their home court. But at the same time, uh, the Celtics have been very good on the road. So this is, again, this is going to be a very, very tough matchup. It's going to be a very hard fought series do you have a prediction oh oh putting me putting me on okay uh i yes i'm going to say i think the miami heat win 
Okay. I, I think I think the Miami Heat uh, will find a way, but I, it's not going to be easy. And I believe this 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 series. You heard it here first. It's going to go to Game Seven. Nice. I think it'll say Game Seven. Awesome. Well, let's hope. Uh, that's uh, yeah. I, I I think these teams are so evenly matched. Uh, I think it's uh, uh, the best of the best, and uh, it's great that it came out like this because uh, mm-hmm. these are two fantastic teams. They were consistent all year round, all year long, and uh, really, really good down the stretch. Uh, they have looked great in the playoffs, and and this is a yeah, this is a dream matchup. Yeah, yeah, it is a dream matchup. You know, like like we were talking about before throughout the course of the season that the East seemed to be um, the one with the most parity between the East and the West, and uh, I was looking forward to see who would get to the top the Eastern Conference uh, mountain, so to speak. And it was these two teams, it was the top two teams in the East, and rightfully so. So I, again, looking forward to seeing how this uh, how this plays out. Looking forward to seeing who steps up in the most crucial moments. At a bio, is it going to be Butler? Is it going to be Tyler Hero at times? And then on the other side, is it going to be Brown, Tatum, or is it going to be some others that will have to find a way to step up as well, like Grant Williams hitting threes and all that sort of stuff, or Al Horford, who seems to be having a resurgence yeah. in this playoffs? I think Adebayo uh, is a bit of a difference for me. I think he's uh, his interior presence, I think, is better than Horford. I think it's better than Williams, uh, who is supposedly healthy enough. He didn't play in that last game. They decided – because it was such a blowout, they didn't have to put him in. But um, I think I, I think him coming back healthy is very crucial to, to Boston winning that inside game, the rebounds and uh, you know points in the paint and stuff. I think that's uh, very crucial. And Adebayo, I think, um, tips the scales uh, for the Heat for me. Yeah, well, Adebayo, he's he's so versatile in what he can do with his skill set because he can also bring the ball up and facilitate not like Jokic not like the Joker no but like just a couple steps down but still super effective when he does that so yeah it's gonna be a great series I can't wait uh, I'm excited uh, we we've got um, let's see uh, the, the first game goes tomorrow night 5 30 Pacific time 8 30 Eastern uh, so and every second day, it'll be, um, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday for the first three games. So, uh, yeah, we're really excited, uh, down in South beach. Uh, uh, I know a lot of people will love to cover this series and, and, uh, it's going to be fun. Uh, let's switch to the West. Um, we had, uh, we, we had Phoenix Suns um, go all the way to the final last year. Uh, have the best season by far, eight games better than anybody in the league. Uh, won a franchise record, 64 games. Uh, really seemed to be the team to beat this year, and uh, it looked like they had decided. Well, we reached the close to the top of the mountain this year. We're going to be able to put it all together and do it. And uh, home teams were 108 and 31 coming into Game Sevens all time. Uh, and uh, that home court advantage did not help for the Suns. An absolute massacre by the Mavericks in this game. It was over by halftime, 57 to 27. Luka Doncic scored as many points as the entire Suns team, and uh, an absolute choke job. Just what happened to Phoenix in this game? Well, you know what happened. Phoenix decided to have their worst game of the year for this crucial, critical game. That's what happened. I'm not, I'm not going to rag on them. I'm not going to say that, you know, Monty Williams should have done this. I uh, should have done that. The team just played God awful. Yeah. They didn't have it. Nobody did on, 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 on the Suns team because look at, look at who your top scorers were for the Suns. All right. Cam Johnson was your top scorer with 12 points. Devin Booker, 11 points. Oh, wait, wait, not done. Chris Paul, 10 points. That is not going to get you. That's not going to get it done. That's not going to win you a series. That's not going to get you anything. And then on the other side of the ball, 
the Mavericks with Luka Doncic just making it look easy. At times, it looked like he was literally playing with the entire Phoenix Suns team. He could literally get whatever shot, whenever he wanted, however he wanted it. He scored the first eight points and never looked back. That's how dominant Luka was. And then also, too, he had his running weight with Dinwiddie and Brunson. Brunson with 24 points and Dinwiddie with 30. They mm -hmm. just didn't look back. They just smashed them. That's yeah. it. Yeah, it was bizarre. Uh, I have not seen Phoenix play that bad uh, in years and years and years. Uh, they had the lowest point total in the first half of the season, uh, lowest field goal percentage, and uh, I don't I don't know what happened. What what happened? I I I, I know the CP3 was hurt. Uh, he's come out to say that uh, he might have to have some surgery. And uh, he was hurt in those last uh, four games of the series. But suddenly Booker just went completely cold, too. Uh, he couldn't buy a bucket. Uh, they were something like 0 for 13 in that first half. And uh, it just didn't even get better in the second half. Uh, did they just run out of gas? That, that's almost what it looked like. It almost looked like they just didn't have enough uh, for the end. For this series, that's that's kind of what it looked like. I don't I don't know if it was that bad. I think it's just one of those things where, unfortunately, and it happens in any any sport in every sport, they just the team collectively had a bad game, yeah. and nobody was on. Nobody was on. Maybe it comes out later that Devin Booker was like nursing an injury or trying to manage an injury. I don't think so. I think Chris Paul definitely was. I, I think that's not in doubt anymore. Yeah. But it's just. They just had a horrible game, and and unfortunately they ran into a buzz call buzz saw called Luka Doncic, and I remember this. I think it was uh, game five. I believe there was some smack talk going back and forth between Luka and Devin Booker, and then Luka said something that was very um, significant, saying everybody likes to talk smack when they're up, and they were up by that time. And guess what happened? The Suns didn't win another game after that. Nice. Wow. Yeah, Luca is um, all worldly and uh, pretty Im impressive, pretty amazing. Um, do you think that um, there's still a bit of uh, a sense of that he wanted to really stick it to the Suns because they uh, drafted DeAndre Ayton uh, over him? And, uh, you know, they've always kind of been compared to each other. Uh, you know, he, do you think he really wanted to show them that they made the biggest mistake? Like we talked about how Jordan did it, you know, many guys use that as motivation. Uh, but, um, yeah, shocking when you think of that, DeAndre Ayton was chosen over Luka Doncic. Yes, it is shocking. And, and not to take anything away from Ayton, he's a great player, but he's not Luka Doncic. All right. He's just, he's not. So with that being said, I think this playoff series, we've seen Luca greatness for the last two seasons now. And you, you thought to yourself at some point in time, this guy's going to break through. This guy's going to do something incredible. I didn't think it would just happen this quickly because right. it, guess what? It's happening right now. And now he gets the chance to really show his skills on the biggest stage in the Western conference finals against the former champs and the Golden State Warriors. Let's see what he really has got now. Yeah. When you look at uh, Aiton's numbers uh, from this game, he only played 17 minutes. And a reporter asked Monty Williams, why only 17 minutes? And he said, internal issue. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm interested to find out uh, what comes out of this. Um, do you think DeAndre Aiton uh, is done with the Suns because they didn't offer him that contract extension? After they went uh, on that run last year, went all the way to the final, a lot of people were quite surprised and shocked that he didn't get his max extension and, uh, you know, one upped. And uh, he went this whole entire year without it. Um, do you think he finally came to a point where he was like, F this team, I'm out of here. Uh, why should I give any more try? Uh, I don't know. It's weird to hear that he only played 17 minutes because there was some kind of problem. That is odd. That is odd because if you look at the way he conducted himself, even with the fact that he didn't 
actually have a contract that he wanted, because I, th- I believe he doesn't want to leave the organization, but he also wants to get paid, that he, treat, like, he, he treated that whole situation as professional as I've ever seen any other player do it. Mm-hmm. How about this? He, he did it way better than James Harden would have. So, yeah. so that, that, that's a feather in his cap, right? And so if he finally felt frustration in the game seven where they were being blown out, you know what? Okay. Okay. I, I'm, I'm going to accept the fact that that actually happened because it was a game seven and they were getting absolutely embarrassed at home. Yeah. All right. And so even if he did play, let's say this, even if DeAndre Ayton played 30, 40 minutes, I don't think he's going to make that much of a difference. Sure. I don't think that's going to have any significant difference on the, the end score of this particular game. Now, is he going to stay going forward? If he gets offered the money, he'll stay. But I don't know if that particular owner, Sarver, he didn't like to spend a lot of money. He didn't like to give money. He spent a lot of money for a lot of players last year. I don't know if he wants to give DeAndre Aiden all that money that he's worth because here it is. At the end of the day, okay, if they let him walk, you're not going to get another guy as good as him. No. That's gone. You're, not, you're just not. So I, I don't know what he's going to do. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Uh, I, I was I was really interested in Monty Williams' um, post game press conference. Uh, he said he thinks he overplayed Devin Booker, Chris Paul. He feels like he burnt them out, and um, you know he he saw what happened at the end, and and you know it sort of slapped him in the face that maybe he overplayed them. Uh, the other thing that I mentioned last week on the podcast that I think Jason Kidd was. Oh, coaching Monty Williams, even though Monty Williams had a great year, was named coach of the year. Um, I, I think he uh, didn't make the adjustments that he, he should have made. Uh, Jason Kidd, I think, uh, really outcoached him and, and, and won the series uh, by, by the adjustments that were made. Yeah, and also, too, I think I, I'm going to give Jason Kidd a little bit more credit, too. He made the adjustments even before they got to this playoff run in the respect that in the regular season, he out and out challenged Luca to be better. And guess what? Luca respected the fact, respected the fact that, oh, wait, my coach is, did my, my position as a point guard for many years, and he's a Hall of Famer. Yeah. He probably knows what he's talking about. I'm going to give him the respect that he's due. And what did Luca do? He got himself in a better shape, and he became a monster. That yeah. he already is, he became more of a monster. Yeah. More. <laughs> right yeah. and then also too with the Suns, with the way that they were attacking him throughout the first uh course of this series they kept coming at him with the screens get him to switch so that they get attack him but guess what he actually got better in his defense too as the series went on and he wasn't getting as exhausted as the series went on as well his yeah. conditioning was actually getting better yeah it's really good <laughs> great point yeah uh, well, they now face the Golden State Warriors, who have uh, seemed to put all those injury troubles in the past that they went through the last couple years, seem to be on a collision course for another championship. Uh, we're able to dispatch the uh, Grizzlies in six games. Uh, obviously, John Morant going down with an injury and being out for the rest of the series was huge and key, but... Um, that sixth game, it just finally showed that the Warriors have really put it all together. Uh, they seem to know how to uh, play with this new assembled team. And uh, look out, uh, I think they're going to give the Mavs a ton of trouble. Well, yeah, because for Golden State, you got three guys that kind of do a certain thing where they're always moving around. Like Steph Curry is the best at relocating to grab the basketball once again. He'll give it up. And that, that's, the, that's the beauty of Golden State's offense. You don't need somebody ball-centric to dominate the ball. They whip that ball around, they relocate, they'll hand the ball off, they'll get it back, and they'll just shoot threes. Yeah. But now the problem is you got three guys that are that good. Yeah. You got Steph Curry, all-time Hall of Famer, future Hall of Famer. You got Clay Thompson, catch-and-shoot specialist, future Hall of Famer. And now you got this stud Jordan Poole who's just like, hey, I just kind of came out of nowhere. And I'm pretty good. <laughs> yeah, and I do the same thing as these two guys do because they yeah. taught me how to do it. So now you got three guys like that 
along with all the other pieces that they have, Golden State just seems to be rounding into form at the perfect time. Yeah. And also, too, it helped help them in this uh, in the respect that, unfortunately, John Morant got injured. Once John Morant went down for the Grizzlies, the Grizzlies didn't have a shot to win this series anymore. It's hard mm -hmm. to say. Yeah. I, I was really impressed with Kevon Looney that uh, final game. He pulled down 22 rebounds. Uh, that's going to be key for, for them against Dallas. Uh, Dallas doesn't have uh, really true centers that, um, you know, can can really give them a lot of those rebounds inside. I thought Wiggins played great. And I think Wiggins is going to be probably the main guy they're going to use on defense against uh, Luka Doncic. I think they'll use, utilize him in the early stages. Clay Thompson might be somebody that they put in. Uh, Andre Iguodala obviously um, can be a guy that they can utilize. Uh, they are going to miss uh, Gary Payton the second, but um, do you think that uh, defensively the Warriors have what it takes to uh, shut down Luka? I'm going to say this. Not really, because that guy's a superstar. You can slow him down, but you're not going to compete, be able to completely stop a guy like that. So, you know what? That guy's just going to get his points. It's everybody else that they're really going to have to focus in on, for sure. And it, and it, it is super saddening that Gary Payton II got injured the way he did because they could have used his defensive expertise in this series coming up. Yeah. And it's just – and I, I'm a little bit – disappointed in the league and the way that they dealt with like the Brooks suspension because that cost the Golden State Warriors a key element to their team and that and Brooks only had to basically give up a game. like I don't know if the injury equated to what the suspension should have been yeah you know what I mean so but uh with that being said hey you got to move on it's the playoffs people get injured all the time Wiggins will have his hands full and he's not going to be able to do it all on his own. He's going to need his other teammates to help him with Luka Doncic because he's a handful. He's a handful. Yeah. This is going to be a fun series. Uh, two very, very electric backcourts that, you know, should be lighting it up. Uh, and if uh, Dinwiddie you know, plays as good as he did in that game seven, uh, we're going to see a shootout. We're going to see some very high scoring games. And, and uh, this is going to be electric, fun, fun basketball to watch. Oh, it's going to be great. It's going to be great basketball to watch uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, when you, when you see these young superstars, there's always a certain time where you don't expect them to kind of grow in the playoffs, but then they all of a sudden just explode. They flourish in the playoffs. And for this particular time, I think it's this year that Luca is definitely going to flourish. He's flourishing right now, and this might be it. This might be it. It might be the ultimate dark horse to get out of the West and make it to the finals. But they have a very tall order in front of them with the Golden State Warriors. Yeah. Are you predicting the maps? Nah, you... man, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm still going with the Golden State Warriors. I'm just saying that the Mavs actually have a very good and bona fide shot to win this Western Conference final. They can do this. Okay. Uh, so do you think it goes the distance, uh, same as the East, or uh, are, are Warriors going to be able to dispatch them a little sooner? I say six. Okay. I say the Warriors in six. Okay. Um, that series starts on Wednesday, uh, 6 o'clock tip-off, uh, Wednesday, Friday, Sunday, Tuesday, the the top four games uh, as i mentioned off the top uh this is number three seed against number four seed golden state won one more game than dallas did in the regular season so they get the three seed and home court advantage those first two games and obviously if it goes all the way to game seven it'll be in golden state uh warriors are always just so deadly at home so hard to beat um you know, they obviously in Oakland where they were for the, the majority of their years, uh, but San Francisco has been good to them too. And I, I think uh, Mavericks are going to have a hard time winning on Golden State's home court. Yeah, they're going to have a very difficult time because everybody had a difficult time winning on Golden State's home court. So it, it's, it's going to be a tall order. <clears throat> but if you have a guy 
yeah, a player by the name of Luka Doncic, anything's possible. Yeah. Anything's possible. Yeah, he's so amazing, fun to watch. Uh, he was just on fire that uh, first half of, of that game seven. Uh, everywhere he went, uh, he was just nailing every shot over everybody. And it was just, uh, it was, it was men. It was a man against boys. I, I was just shocked. He he was not, they could not stop him no matter what he did in that first half. No, they couldn't stop him. Uh, he hit turnarounds. He hit threes. He hit step backs. He got his uh, teammates involved. He literally did whatever he wanted to do on that court at that time. And then what compounded the situation a bit more is that the Suns couldn't even make any shots. Well, this guy's making it look like he's playing against a high school team. So yeah, it was Rough. the sec. It was the second largest road win in Game Seven history, and tied for the fifth largest win in Game Seven history, home or away. Uh, it was with Doncic and Dinwiddie both getting thirty points. It was the first teammate with 30 plus points in a game seven since Shaq and Kobe in 2002. That's pretty historic. Wow. Yeah. Never, never thought I, yeah, I never thought I'd hear Don Kitchen Dimwitty <laughs> along with the, the, the names of Shaq and Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So let's just, um, we, we've kind of made our predictions and we're going forward, but uh, can we just break down quickly the, the Suns? Uh, where do they go from here? Um, they they seem to have just an absolutely monster year, but um, do they do they have to get what do they have to get to get to that next level? Because uh, it almost seems like they actually have all the pieces they need to get to the next level. Uh, personally, for me, I would think it would be a, a, like a, a very good idea to re-sign DeAndre Ayton again. I think what he brings to the table fits that team perfectly. I really do. And also, too, he seems to want to get better. That's the kind of player that you always want. You want mm -hmm. a guy that always wants to improve his craft because he seems like he's a little bit more invested than a player like, uh, I don't know, Ben Simmons. But that's a guy that you want. And I think that's the improvement. And then also, too, just the minor tweaks, maybe some more toughness defensively. Uh, somebody else that's uh, maybe could help Mikel Bridges out defensively as a defensive stalwart. Yeah. Things of this nature. But I, to myself, I don't think that the Suns need a complete overhaul. I, I think that's, that's definitely not what they need. They just need a couple of subtle tweaks to just get them over the hump. But I think letting Aiton walk would probably be a mistake, personally. Okay. Uh, they're notable free agents. Uh... Andre, DeAndre Ayton is a restricted free agent. Uh, they also have uh, Aaron Holiday as a restricted free agent. Their unrestricted free agents are JaVale McGee and Bismack Biombo, uh, both backup centers. Um, but obviously Ayton is the biggest key. Um, Chris Paul led the league in assists a game this year, just under 11 assists a game. Uh, Devin Booker got his third all-star selection. Um, they... Uh, they were the dominant team this year. Uh, it just seemed like maybe Chris Paul at 37 was feeling his age. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get some new, more details probably on his injury troubles in the, the end of that. But um, can you count on a 37-year-old Chris Paul to take this team to the promised land and, and get a title? Uh, do you need somebody that's going to eat up a ton more minutes and he can come in? in spot duty uh, during the regular season. So you're not burning him out. Um, do you think uh, that they can, you know, count on him to be their number one point guard uh, through oh, the whole season? That's not good. Are you there? How's that's never happened before. Did, did, did I freeze? Did I freeze? Or I, you're frozen, but are, did, did I freeze for you? Jason, Jason, Jason. 
Yeah, we've got a frozen Jason Cameron. Okay, he's logged out quick and he's logged back okay. in. Did I, I, okay. I guess I froze on you, did I? Yes, yeah, like, like, like literally. That was, I don't think I've ever seen you fro freeze like that before. You were just like, Gah! and then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> I'm glad you're back on. Uh, yeah. I was just saying, can, can, can the Suns count on a 37 year old Chris Paul to play all those minutes and uh, stay healthy and, and take this team to that next level? They, they, they've, they were really close last year, amazing year this year. Uh, but do they need somebody that's going to eat up tons of minutes for them so he doesn't have to play as much and he can kind of get into the playoffs healthier? Um, well, they, they do have, a, I think, a very competent uh, backup in Cameron Payne. Okay. And I think that he can do the job because he's been literally being mentored by Chris Paul all this time anyways. Yeah. But at the same time, we're seeing it now that uh, as Chris Paul gets further along in these last two seasons, especially, unfortunately, not, not anything to do with him, injuries happen. And they've been mounting on him. And I know that he takes great, tremendous care of his body. But as he's getting older, these injuries seem to be increasing, and especially down the stretch. So what you say makes a lot of sense, maybe by decreasing his minutes, maybe by sharing the load with like a Cameron Payne so that he's just he's not so worn when he gets to the playoffs would be a very good idea. But also, when they gave him that contract, they knew that he, they, he, the team would be getting diminishing returns from a Chris Paul because that's just a natural thing. He's getting older. Yeah. All right. So I don't know how many more years he has in him. I didn't know he had this left in him and he oh, did. Yeah. So maybe he still has one more great year left, one more push to see if he can get to the promised land. Okay. Uh, what about the Bucks? Uh, break down their season. Uh, third time in the last four seasons, 50 plus wins. Obviously, the title last year. Uh, Giannis is uh, all worldly. Uh, became the franchise all-time leading scorer this year and had a you know phenomenal season again. Great playoffs. Um, they have some notable free agents in uh, Bobby Portis and uh, Pat Connaughton, as well as uh, Wesley Matthews and Serge Ibaka. Uh, I think Connaughton and Portis are are very key uh, bench pieces and guys that stepped up in in crucial times for them. Um, obviously Middleton, you know, missing Middleton, those last nine playoff games were massive, but, um, is there much that, uh, Milwaukee has to do, or if they run it back with pretty much what they have, we could see a, a, another title run. Yeah, I, I think so. Like, I think the unfortunate part of this particular playoff run is that Middleton got injured. They didn't actually have their full complement of people for their team. And then going forward for the next year. I think they definitely resigned Portis. Uh, the, the city loves that guy. And he's an integral part of their team. And Pat Connaughton, I would say that. Maybe not as much as Bobby Portis, but uh, he's there as well. And then the other two guys, they can let them walk and try to get other pieces that fit their team and fit their mold. Okay, you mentioned the city of Milwaukee. Uh, at the end of that game the other night, uh, there was some shootings. Uh, it seemed to spark a bunch of crazy shootings uh, around the U.S. Uh, there was three separate incidents where I think 22 people all together got shot. Um, we, we had a riot here after 1994 Canucks going to the Stanley Cup final 2011. Uh, we took a lot of bad press as this is a terrible city. They let uh, rioting happen. Horrible, horrible. But I think 22 people shot in three separate incidents around the arena uh, after that game. Um, crazy. Like, what's going on in, in the world? And what's going on around a sporting event where, you know, guns are going to be brought out and, and people are going to get shot over trying to enjoy their, their team playing basketball? Well, it's ridiculous. No, nobody... Nobody should have to die from watching a sporting event, all right? Like, 
Nobody should have to die from something like that. That's just utterly ridiculous. But also, too, I think because of the extraordinary situation and circumstances that we've all been put through across the globe with COVID, I think there's something to be said about that. I think that's something to be said about having been cooped up for so long and having all this extra angst and frustration and whatever. And then all of a sudden now you throw into the, the impassioned feelings that you feel from sports and then things are just all, I don't know, messed up. Your emotions are messed up. But at the same time, you know, some sort of logic has to come into play where it's just like, do I need my gun when I go to a basketball game? Well, no. <laughs> all right. No, you don't. Yeah. But at the same time, it's the U.S. where, you know, carrying a gun is your right as an American citizen, apparently. And, uh, you know, being protected is also your right. So that's why you carry a gun. I don't know. I, I just I feel that first off, if you're going out to enjoy yourself for a sporting event, I don't think you need a gun. All right. Yeah. Number one, I just don't think you need a gun. I think you just go to a basketball event. There's many basketball events that I've gone through in my lifetime. Never had a gun. Weird. I know, yeah. right? Yeah. Super weird. Super weird. So. Very strange. Yeah. Uh my my dad, um, my dad and my stepmom are visiting uh my aunt down in North Carolina. And my uh stepmom and my aunt went to the mall uh while they were down there the other day, and there was a shooting in the mall. They got locked into a store for about half an hour. Uh, while the cops came in and tried to sort it out. Uh, supposedly, it was a dispute between a couple guys in the food court. Both pulled out guns and started shooting each other. Um, that shocked me that, uh, you know, that was so close to home, being uh, my family was in the same mall. Um, at, a, at a grocery store in Buffalo, New York, uh, on, over the weekend, 10 people were killed. Um at a, a church in California, uh, a bunch of people were shot. I think one person was killed. Uh, it's just um, crazy how we're hearing about this year after year after year after year, and uh, things aren't being done to, to change this. Uh, how could you want to uh, be living in a society where you go to the grocery store, you go to your church, you go to the mall, you, you go to a basketball game, and you run the risk of not coming home. Uh, there's got to be some changes made. And uh, I, I'm shocked that we're still talking about this in 2022, uh, that there's mass shootings happening all the time, that uh, it's becoming almost like, oh, yeah, another thing happened. Oh, uh, we'll talk about it for a day, and then it's on to the next thing. Uh, this is um, something that's got to change. Uh, I, I can't fathom having to worry about my life just walking out my door at all times but you notice where the epidemic is always happening it's not happening anywhere else on the globe it's always happening in the u.s you know so and then that's that's that stems from uh, their culture of everybody needs a gun all right and and i think that culture is toxic in the respect that well if i get into dispute well i'm just gonna pull my gun and then I'll end it that way. Yeah. And and I and I, it that's not the correct way to end anything. <laughs> it's no. it's just not it's just not the correct way to end anything. So, and also too with the fact that as these incidences keep coming coming around, we're getting more desensitized to it. So we're just like ah, well, you know that's gonna happen. No, no, actually it should not happen. You shouldn't see fifteen people being shot. That that just shouldn't happen. Yeah. But. Are things going to change? Are they going to change it through the politics in that country? Well, they've had a lot of time and nothing has changed. Yeah. So in my, in my humble opinion, nothing will change. I don't know if they want it to change. Crazy, hey? Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, on to things um, a little uh, with a little less um, problems. Um, we, we can go into some uh, yeah, combat sports. Um, uh, yeah, there, there's violence, but it's contained and uh, it doesn't involve anybody uh, you know, having to worry about losing their life uh, on a daily basis. Um, we had UFC Vegas 54 
Uh, it was a light heavyweight battle between the former champion uh, Jan Blahovic fighting an upstart uh, that most people say um, can be the champ one day, Alexander Rakic. Uh, this was a titanic battle. A lot of people had Rakic winning. He was the favorite going in, and uh, it was uh, it was a hell of a fight uh, until it uh, lasted very uh, prematurely. Um, Alexander Rakic uh, blew out his ACL and has to have surgery. Uh, it was one of those freak accidents that uh, can happen in combat sports. Uh, just step back and all of a sudden you see his knee give out and he's on the ground in pain. Uh, fight over. Uh, quite a shocking end to uh, a really good fight up until that moment. It was a fantastic fight. Um, each man, each, uh, yeah, each combatant was kind of doing their game plan. Like uh, they were both fo- throwing like calf kicks. They're both trying to chip away at each other, so to speak. Yeah. And then in that third round where Rakic is just taking a step back and you see it in slow motion, kind of gross. You see his knee just kind of give out. You like, you literally see his knee go, but do a little weird wiggle where it's like, oh, your knee's not supposed to do that. Yeah, yeah, he's done. Yeah. And then when he went down clutching his knee, it's like, yeah, yeah, fight's over. And it sucked because the, the fight, I was very much looking forward to um, the championship rounds of the fourth and the fifth because whoever was winning those fourth and the fifth was going to win the fight because it was super close. I did not know who was winning that fight up to that point, unfortunately, when that when, when that injury happened. Yeah. So hopefully at some point in time when Rackage gets better, but that's going to be a long time now in the future. Maybe they get to run this back. But we don't know what the future is going to hold. Maybe Blahovich becomes a champ again. Yeah. Because I believe uh, Glover Teixeira already said that if Blahovich wins this fight, he wouldn't mind giving him another rematch after he has his fight. Yeah. And hopefully – um, they, they have set up a date for Glover to share it, to fight, uh, Yuri Perhachka. Uh, mm-hmm. that's coming up at UC 275, June 11th. So, um, I think, uh, Blahovich should fight the winner of that. Um, what do you think? I think so too. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. He's the number one. He, he's, he's the number one opponent. Uh, he beat his, he beat Rakic. Uh, unfortunately, with due to the injury, but it's still a win. So yeah, that's what makes sense. The um, the other fight that uh, maybe if he wants to stay busy in the meantime, maybe this gets pushed. Uh, maybe one guy gets injured uh, in the fight. Uh, you know, between Tushera and Perhachka, uh, there is a great battle set up uh, for USC two seventy seven, July thirtieth, between Anthony Lionheart Smith and Megamed Ankalaev. Uh, that that's number four and number five. Um, he could possibly fight the winner of those guys. If you wanted to tune up fight, uh, you never know how long a guy wants to be off. Uh, you know, especially at his age, advanced age, it's good to be a little busier. Um, so yeah, we could see that, but um, I think he deserves that title shot of whoever wins between uh, Teixeira and Perhachka. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with you on that. I, I think he's definitely earned it with this uh, win, win, I say with bunny ears, win over Rakic. Yeah. But uh, he, he's definitely earned he definitely earned that right. Did you, um, who did you, who do you think was was winning at that moment? Uh, who was who was taking, taking that decision? If it went to a decision, let's say it was only going to go three rounds. <sighs> It is uh, okay. It was super close. All right. I, I think I might have given the edge to Blahovich slight, okay. slight edge. But it felt like Rakic was coming on too at the same time. And then that injury happened. So, yeah. Yeah. That was crazy. And they just kept showing replays of it. And you just yeah, see yeah. the knee buckle and buckle and buckle <laughs> and just over. It. Oh, slow it down. Show it from a different angle. Buckle, buckle. You're like, oh, man. Like, I, 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 you know, a lot of guys, people ask, uh, you know, journalists ask, oh, have you watched, watched that fight uh, since it happened? Uh, I would recommend him not watching that because it was just, how many times can we see that? It, uh, it, yeah. was, uh, it was messed up. No, yeah, it, it's kind of like the one thing where it's like, oh, oh, did he break his leg? 
let, let's put that on rewind and keep watching it over and over and over again. No, man, it's, it's gross. It's gross. And the guy's really hurt himself. Okay. Yeah. And so if you're asking him to, here's another thing I was actually super impressed with is that Rakic didn't actually get gurneyed off. He walked out of the octagon, yeah. which is, oh, that dude is super tough. Because I know for me, I'd be crying and I'd say, <laughs> no, get me the gurney. Or, or I'd be yelling, medic. Medic, <laughs> medic. Like, yeah, that would that would be me. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, it was uh, nasty. Uh, but he's he's tough, and those these guys, as we say, week after week, uh, toughest guys on the planet. So um, yeah, he was like, no, nope, I'm walking out of here. So um, yeah, but let's hope his surgery goes really well, and he's back uh, back training very soon, and can get back in the cage. Uh, sometime maybe later this year or early in 2023. Uh, why don't we talk about the co-main event a little bit? Um, great battle between uh, light heavyweights there as well. Ryan Spann against Ion Kutalaba. Uh, really slick, amazing submission uh, locked in by Spann and uh, got the big victory. I'm always amazed at how big Spann is once he finally gets in the ring. Kudalaba is not a small man, and Span is still bigger than him. Yeah. All right. Like yeah. so, like like I I I told you then, I thought this was going to be a quick fight. That's how we're going to get knocked out. What I didn't expect was that it would end by submission. <laughs> I did not see that coming. Yeah. But Span, that was a beautiful submission. He was able to sprawl. He got put on his back. I think two to three times before. He got that guillotine choke in. And once he got that in, that was so ridiculously tight. Yeah. And Kudalaba tapped in a heartbeat. Yeah. He didn't so even have it One of the yeah. fastest taps I've ever seen. Just, uh, yeah, as soon as it was locked in, he, he knew he wasn't getting out of it. But, you know, you would have thought it would have taken him a few more seconds to realize it. But that was a fast, fast, fast tap. No, it was a fast tap because that's a very, very powerful man that's trying to squeeze the life out of you, yeah. like, like, like kill you. Right. And so Kudalaba, as he's getting his life squeezed out of him, is probably thinking, I better tap before I die. <laughs> so I'm just going to tap. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's time to tap. I didn't want to die here. So there he did. Yeah. Um, there's some talk about Span fighting the uh, maybe the um, the winner of Paul Craig and Volkan Ozdemir, uh, who are set to fight on July 23rd. So um, uh, I don't know if he could uh, do the same to Paul Craig, who seems to be one of the best submission <laughs> submission artists in the sport. Uh, but um, uh, kind of interesting to hear those two names thrown out there uh, as a yeah. possible next opponent. Yeah, I know that that's that those are great opponents, possibilities. But if Span does end up fighting Paul Craig, word of advice, don't go to the ground with that guy. That's not a good idea. No, yeah. Paul <laughs> Craig is crazy good uh grappling, amazing. So um okay, um uh, let's talk about Davy Grant's big uh huge knockout victory uh early on in the third round. Uh, this was a hell of a fight. Uh, him and Smoka really were uh, gi giving each other a ton of damage. Uh, I was impressed by both guys, but uh, Davey caught Smoka and was able to uh, take him out with a big knockout victory. Yes. Um, I was impressed with Smoka's durability, resilience, and absolute toughness. He got hit with huge shots from Grant from the first round. And he just kept coming, like the Terminator. But eventually, those calf kicks finally did their job. He invested in the calf kicks, and he kept coming back to it. And eventually, to the point where he chopped out his leg, and you could tell Smoka couldn't actually stand anymore. Yeah. Like, if it actually, if he made him try to stand up again, I don't know if Smoka could have done it. No. I really don't. I don't know if he could have done it. Yeah. But it, he didn't need to do it. As he took him to the ground after take, kicking out his leg like that and then knocked him out with ground and pound. Yeah. And that's another thing you don't see too often when a man knocks another guy out with severe ground and pound. I was super impressed with Grant's performance. 
Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, it was. Uh, okay, um, some comments on the uh, big women's flyweight fight. Uh, two top flyweights in the women's division, Caitlin Chukagian against Amanda Hebas. Uh, decision victory, but uh, this was a hell of a battle. Uh, these both girls, very skilled, uh, two of the top top flyweights. And um, yeah, this was a really impressive fight. Yeah. Uh, Rebus was very good at always getting that uh, headlock judo throw uh, sort of deal. And it literally came down to your classic grappler versus your cra classic striker. Whenever Chukagin was on her feet, she was winning. Whenever Rebus got her to the ground, she was winning. Yeah. That's why the fight was incredibly close. But in the third round, I think Chukagin had the he had the advantage with the stand up and was able to keep her distance management a bit better than the last two rounds and that's what won her the fight yeah yeah i agree um she's the number one ranked fighter at flyweight i don't think they're going to um uh give her a title shot quite yet uh the current champ is valentina shevchenko you're one of your favorite fighters in the usc uh, she's uh, about to face Talia Santos in UFC 275 coming up in June, June 11th. Um, so I think that uh, probably uh, she will be next um, uh, against uh, Shevchenko. Um, what do you think? doesn't matter, actually. That, that's what I think. I think it doesn't matter. I don't think any lady in that division has literally any shot of beating Shevchenko. Yeah. I'm sorry to say it. Ladies, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. But she's better than everybody in that freaking division. She just is. She's at the top of the mountain. She's like right there. Mount Everest. Yeah. And then you trying to scale to Mount Everest? Yeah, you're not making it, man. I'm sorry. You're not making it. Yeah. She, she had her shot against Valentina, USC 247, February 8th, 2020. Uh, she was knocked out in the third round, one minute in the third round. And uh, she also lost to Jessica Andrade uh, after that in October 18th of 2020. But she's won uh, five of, of her last six fights. So um, uh, she's she's right up there. She's beat Cynthia Calvillo, Viviana Arujo, who fought on this card as well. Jennifer Maya and Amanda Hebas. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, she, uh, Valentina Shevchenko is the class of this division and, and far and away better than anybody else. But I think Chukagian uh, will get that next shot after Talia Santos. Yeah, yeah. I, I think she deserves it. I think she's earned it. She's earned the right to face Shevchenko and to lose to her again. Yes, she has earned that right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, we got to fly through some of this, but uh, do you want to mentioned any of the other guys on the uh, main card. Uh, we got the Frank yes. Macho Manuel Torres and Jake Hadley against Alan Nascimento. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I'm, I wanted to say something about Nascimento. Super. I was, I was incredibly impressed with his grappling technique. It's clear that he's with the Oliveira camp because I saw a lot of his uh, impressioning on the way that he fights because his grappling and his submissions were Really, really good. Like, like really yeah. good. Yeah. I was super impressed with that. It, 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 for me, anyways, whenever Hadley went down to the ground, it was an adventure for him because that guy was super tricky. He was able to do sweeps by going through for submissions, especially with leg locks or knee locks. He basically was able to flow for whatever he could get his, like, whatever limb he could get. Yeah. And I, I was just impressed with how he scrambled, how he grappled against Hadley, who was undefeated up to that point. And uh, yeah, yeah, and that's why he's not cemental one. And he had great reverses too, whenever um, Hadley had top position, he was able to reverse him in very slick, impressive ways. Yeah. Super impressed by not cemental. Yeah, he was amazing. Uh, I was impressed mm -hmm. too. Um, you mentioned Michael Johnson being a guy that you really wanted to look forward to on this card when we did the preview last week and uh yeah he uh, came out with a very impressive knockout uh good old good to see uh michael johnson back in there and uh, getting a huge win over a really tough guy 
every time I see Michael Johnson fight, I'm always impressed with him because he always comes out super impressive. He's always Chris. The speed of his hands is something to behold. It yeah. really is. Like yeah. it is just absolutely amazing. And when he has it going on, he really does. Footwork was exceptional about uh because Patrick would try to rush him and he was able to circle, always circling and scrambling, not going straight back, always angling off at an angle to get out of like harm's way. I, I just I was so impressed. And then to finish him off with a four punch combo, nice. Yeah. Nicely done. Yeah. Nicely no, done. It was very impressive. Uh, incredible. Uh, yeah. A le- one of the legends really of the sport been around for a really long time and uh, yeah, has had some ups and downs, but uh, great to see him get the big victory. Uh, I mentioned off the start of the card, <coughs> don't don't sleep on Andre Petrosky and Nick Maximoff, and uh, they didn't disappoint. Uh, two super tough guys, but Petrosky was able to get the big submission win very very quick. Uh, speaking of uh, fast taps, uh, was able to just get in there. Uh, the guy wasn't able to tap and went to sleep. Uh, Petrosky looked great in this one. Holy cow. He's, he's a, a really amazing prospect coming up. Yes, he is. Amazing prospect, uh, dominant win. And also to the way that he got that submission, didn't even allow the man to tap. Wow. <laughs> yeah. He was, wow. uh, unconscious, uh, so quickly. And yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty incredible. Yeah. So yeah, good card um, had they had uh, in Vegas. Uh, we've got another one coming up this Saturday. Uh, we've got an, it's an earlier card. Um, not as, not as late as this past one. Uh, uh, the main event has Holly Holm against Caitlin Vieira. Uh, looking forward to seeing Holly. It's been a little while uh, since she's been in the cage. Uh, what do you think of this one? Yeah, it has been a long time since we've seen Holly Holm in the octagon. And uh, I'm looking forward to see what new wrinkle she may have added to her game because she's going to be fighting a very game Caitlin Vieira. But I still give Holly Holm uh, the nod in this particular battle. I think she wins this one. Yeah. Uh, Co-main should be fun. Uh, two great strikers, Santiago Ponzinibbio and Michelle Pereira. Uh, Pereira seems to be... Uh, not dancing as much and, uh, you know, trying to get, uh, be, uh, you know, a full-on fighter. Uh, he's usually bigger than his opponents. I'm not sure if he'll be bigger than Ponzinibbio in this one, but um, I think this will be a hell of a war. I think this is going to be a very impressive fight. As long as Pereira stays away from a lot of the flash, and you, know, you, know, you know he's going to do some of it. Yeah. As long as he doesn't do the whole fight like that, I think then he'll give himself a chance to win. But I am definitely still going with Ponzinibbio on this one. Love the way that he fights. He's a warrior, and he will never give up on himself, yeah, ever. That's true. Uh, the middleweight fight between uh, Chidi Njikawani and Dusko Tudovoric, uh, that should be a heck of a battle. Both those guys uh, always bring it. Yeah, both those guys always bring it. Uh, very much a difference in styles. I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Yeah. And uh, Chase Hooper uh, on the prelim card, a guy to always um, look out for, one of the young guys on the card, uh, super fun to watch. And, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a good card. Quite a few um, great matchups uh, that we that we see put together so far. Yeah, I, I think it's going to be a great card. And also, too, cards like this, it's always nice when you come on early so that you have the rest of your night to do whatever you like. So, yeah, always good. Always good. Um, okay, before we uh, put this uh, episode to bed, I want to mention some boxing that um, happened over the weekend. They had a really great card in California, uh, Showtime Boxing, <laughs> and uh, Outdoors uh, was really a, a great matchup. Uh, did you get to see? Um, did you get to see the Showtime card on on Saturday night? Unfortunately, I did not. Unfortunately, okay. I did not. Okay, well, the, uh, the the big main event fight was Brian Castano against Jermel Charlo. It was for the 154-pound uh, light middleweight championship. Uh, Jermel had three belts, the WBA, WBC, and IBF, and Castano was the WBO champion uh, from Argentina. 
Uh, Castano, no losses in his career, 17-0-2. Uh, Jamel, uh, 34-1-1. And um, this was a great fight. Uh, Charlo got um, the early uh, first three rounds. Castano won the next three. Uh, this was a rematch. They fought uh, about a year and a half ago. And uh, this was a split decision um, draw. First time that they uh, battled. Um, and then uh, after that sixth round, there all of a sudden Charlo seemed to uh, step into a higher gear, was landing the... Uh, heavier shots and and finally got a a knockout blow. Uh, he knocked down Castano in the tenth round uh, with a uh, he, he kind of hit him with a a, a left and it uh, was a delayed knockdown. He fell down. His legs weren't under him very well. The the referee gave him a shot to go at it. Um, Charlo came in with a flurry. Was able to hit him with a body shot. Uh, an uppercut and ended the fight there. Uh, first four time or four belt champion uh, in the um, division's history. And uh, first time um, we're, we're able to see a guy uh, unify uh, since Winky Wright back in 2004. Uh, but the first time in the four belt era, uh, super impressive and a uh, hell of a fight. Uh, I love the fight card. Uh, I was able to catch uh, most of the fights on the card. I think I, I remember seeing the fight, their first fight that they fought, and I was super impressed with both men's will to win. Yeah. And I'm sure that this second fight was just the same thing. But uh, I would have thought Jamel Charlo was going to win this fight. Uh, that dude is super impressive, along with his twin brother who also boxes. Jamal, I yeah. think, Jamal. and I think he's also a champion. Uh, those two are incredibly impressive and an incredibly impressive win for a guy that was pretty much on his level, neck and neck. That's why they drew in the first place for him to knock a guy like that out shows his uh, shows just how much he's advanced in his boxing acumen and how much he's improved. Yeah, no, I was uh, really impressive. Uh, awesome. And like you say, uh, yeah, the, the two, uh, the two twin brothers, uh, both the champions and he becomes only the seventh undisputed male champion in the four belt era uh, listen to the the guys uh, that he joins in that same class uh, Canelo Alvarez super middleweight all four belts Josh Taylor uh, super lightweight uh, 2021 got all four belts Alexander Usyk in the cruiserweight in 2018, uh, Terrence Bud Crawford, 2017, the super lightweight. And then we go back quite a few years to Jermaine Taylor, 2005 in the middleweight and Bernard Hopkins, same division, 2004. Jermaine took those belts off of uh, Hopkins after. So uh, pretty elite company that he joined there. Very elite company. Hall of Fame company. Yeah. So looks like his future looks pretty bright. If he can just keep doing what he's doing, yeah, looks like the Hall of Fame is definitely going to come a knocking for Charlo. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, uh, over the weekend, uh, there was a another death in the world of boxing. A uh, a German boxer um, had a heart attack uh, in the middle of the fight, uh, fell down, and uh, they were not able to um, <laughs> to revive him. And uh, it was a um, pretty crazy uh, scene. Um, boxing, uh, you know, has uh, deaths and injuries um, like this uh, every year. Uh, we never see it in uh, MMA, but um, yeah, pretty tragic. Uh, I was uh, quite shocked to hear that, um, yeah, as he was, um, he, as he was coming up for the third round, uh, he just um, had a heart attack, fell down on the canvas and uh and passed away yeah that's sad that that's it it's it's incredibly sad uh probably that could have been due to a prior heart condition that nobody knew about yeah. you just never know these things but uh you know whenever anybody steps into one of these combat sports these are the risks you take these are the risks you take yeah shocking uh shocking the, that it happened but um 
I guess uh, he died doing what he was, what he loves. And um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I feel for his family and, and, and his friends and, and the people that loved him. Um, but, um, you know, we love watching combat sports. Uh, you know, we just hope that um, they all can uh, go home safely uh, after the boat. Yeah, of course, because this is not ancient Rome anymore. Where we go do it, throw them in the gladiatorial pit, knowing that only one of those guys is walking out. We don't do that anymore. No, this is a very unusual night. Uh, no basketball, no hockey, uh, uh, empty night uh, on the sports calendar. But glad we could get this episode in. And uh, yeah, the NBA conference finals are upon us. Uh, looking forward to both these matchups. Uh, uh, man, this is must see TV. Uh, if you're a basketball fan, you know you're going to be watching. If you're not, uh, do yourself a favor and, and watch these matchups. You'll become a basketball fan watching these four teams go at it. Yeah, it, they, these are. this is going to be high-level basketball. It's going to be exceptionally competitive, and I cannot wait to see who's going to be in the finals out of these four teams. It's going to be really hard to call. We're crowning a new champion. Uh, both, uh, team, uh, both teams that went to the finals last year were both eliminated yesterday, so there'll be a a new champion. Um, I think Golden State's uh, going to pull it off again this year. And um, yeah, lucky me, because uh, that's my favorite team and uh, a team that I think uh, plays basketball the right way and uh, super, super fun. You mentioned earlier about their passing and and uh, they don't worry about giving it up. There's a lot of teams where you worry, if I give this basketball up, I ain't getting it back, so I'm not giving it up. <laughs> Uh, but uh, you never have to worry about that with the Warriors. No, man, because they, they trust in each other and they share the basketball. And then as far as I'm concerned, that's the best way to play basketball is by sharing the basketball and not having one guy being ball dominant and just playing with the basketball while everybody else stands around and watches. That's not basketball to me. Yeah. But what the Warriors do is basketball. It's beautiful to watch, and they're really good at it. And they, really and they always look like they're having fun. They always yeah. just look like it's this, you know, hey, I'm doing this for a job. I'm going to have a lot of fun doing it. And uh, it seems to uh, really, you know, bring that crowd into it. Uh, it seems like the most fun atmosphere you can have at a live sporting event. It's infectious. That's what it is. It's infectious. They, they bring their joy to the game and they bring it to their fans. And then it just spreads, you know, from that. So the Mavericks are going to have their hands full with the Golden State Warriors. They really are. Yeah. Okay, man. We'll enjoy it. Uh, good luck in uh, getting better. I hope those back spasms are gone. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you can get into a little more rehab this week. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate this as always. Uh, it was fun. And I, I look forward to uh, talking to you through the week as the, as the conference finals continue. Yeah, man. I look forward to it as well. Uh, again, thanks for having me on as always. Till the next time. Till okay. Next Monday. Okay. Good night. Cheers. Bye for now. Cheers. Bye now. Okay. Bye. okay. Uh, fantastic uh, episode. Uh, great to be able to break down all that. Um, yeah, basketball. Uh, it's going to be uh, phenomenal to watch, and I'm excited. Um, yeah. And I'm, uh, yeah, USC as always. Um, uh, we got another card uh, every Saturday. So, um, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for sticking in and watching. Uh, really appreciate your support as always. And um, yeah, uh, I guess we will talk uh, definitely one week from tonight and uh, hopefully uh, sooner. Uh, I do want to mention our partners and sponsors uh, before we go. Uh, I want to thank um, Anchor FM. Uh, easiest place to make a podcast and fantastic at posting on multiple podcast forums for us. Uh, Verbero, the hockey equipment and apparel company, uh, leader in uh, technology uh, and value. Uh, really fantastic. Uh, V356 is something that you need to get in your hands if you're a hockey player. Uh, we have um, Pampas and Possibilities. Uh, get them to come in and design your home make it look great. Um, they are awesome at their job. And uh, Forever Living, the aloe vera company for health and beauty products. Uh, as always, we love you guys. Thanks so much for all your support. And um, yeah, take care. Have a great week ahead. Uh, we are on the edge of summer. Uh, it's coming. It's coming soon. And uh, we can't wait. 
uh, the days are sure uh, nice and light late. And uh, I love this time of year when it starts getting nice and everybody's going to be out uh, enjoying their barbecues and the beach and uh, all the uh, great activities that happen in the summer. So um, take care of yourself. Uh, yeah, have a great week ahead. We'll talk soon. Bye for now.